Um, so thank you everybody uh, for joining in and um, thank you Kristen for being our presenter and I'm going to turn it back to you and we can rock and roll. Cool. Um, all right, so we're going to get started over here. So I am talking to you all around uh, three topics that are really important to me. And uh, one is leadership, the other is love, and the third is belonging. And it happens to be the tagline for my consulting business as well. And to make this fully embraceable for everyone on this call, I would like for all of you to not only turn on your cameras, but unmute yourselves. I know that is so anti, you know, web conference calls, but one of the things that I lose out on by being on a video call is the interaction between all of us together in hearing each other laugh or boo or whatever kind of verbal response that we're having while we're talking. So I highly encourage you to unmute your microphones and it doesn't matter if the dog is barking in the background or the cat walks across your, your laptop while you're on the call. It's all part of the life we're living right now. So I highly encourage you to, to do that. Um, as long as you don't live near a trash truck route or, or something crazy like that, I want to hear audible uh, responses from all of you tonight so that we can really engage as if we were in, in person. First is to get you to think more interactively as a group, as a community, which is what we are. When you think of the word leadership and you look at these definitions and the definition and the synonyms here, don't, do any of them bother you? Do any of them look like things that you wouldn't expect to see or you don't agree should be part of the definition of leadership or a synonym to that? Oh. Yeah? Supervision. Yeah? Directed. Yeah. I'm like, wait, So wait. leaders are the examples. We will follow them. Uh, yeah. They're not going to super supervise us they're gonna encourage us uh, inspire us mm. so they don't need to supervise yeah, yeah. so it, it's it's almost like these are like 1950s and 60s definitions of leadership who the hell believes in this stuff anymore but the reality is most of us know people who are in the workplace who have management positions that have been taught leadership training or maybe didn't have any training at all about how to be a manager and they do use these definitions quite literally um, in the way that they act at work so for us to understand where everyone is coming from we also have to look back at the history um, of what defines leaders in the past so just look at this timeline uh, first of all look at what my belief of leadership might look a little bit more like this. <laughs> we don't always agree with what leaders act, look like, dress. You know, it used to be that their suit and the tie and the formal wear kind of thing in, in the workplace. And now with all the different private and public industries, uh, we have a lot of flexibility in some areas. And then we have a lot of historical, no, that's not allowed here. You still have to like like dress down Friday is you don't have to put a jacket on. You still have to wear the slacks and things like that. Now for most of us here in the Denver area, we have a little bit less of that in, in for the most part because of the way our lifestyles are here. You know, people are outdoorsy, they're active, they're a little bit looser on that sort of stoic leadership quality. But there are still some people that come from uh, historical management trends. And so if you look at some of that, and how they might have learned to be uh, leaders. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, all the way back to like 1840s and so forth, we've got folks who were taught maybe a workforce is more of like, who's to blame? You are put in a position of power because then it's your fault when something doesn't work well. Um, in the 1880s, we started to see the military influence management styles because we see now there's a, a delegation and decision-making model that they put in place, and it was part of some mission tactics. Uh, in the 1910s, it was more of like this whole one best way. Uh, people are experts, and so if they are experts, they're kings. They're the ones who are leading everything. Then we also have the 1920s, where you're getting more of the on-the-job training so more people are learning how to do things as they are in the office or, or in the workplace. So you have supervisors instructing ship yeah. on how to build ships. 
uh, 1930s, then we have another military influence of the German Army Field Manual, where they actually start to say things like, while the battlefield is the most important place for the people well, closest they to the to make real-time decisions, so it's, it's more important that they actually be given the information and the, the power to make decisions locally, because they have to be immediate. They can't wait for someone to decide whether or not I should shoot someone who's 10 feet from me or less. And then in the 40s, we've got folks who are also thinking about um, wartime. And we have the first introduction of treating workers with respect, which is interesting because that's not something that we had seen in the years prior. Um, notice around the 1940s too, this is around the end or actually part of wartime and Deming who many of you, if you're familiar with uh, Lean and some of the other Agile practices, uh, he was introducing a new model of Lean thinking and the way that things were manufactured. Well, the U.S. didn't really pay attention to what he had, so he goes to Japan and helps them instead. Um, also, right around the end of the war, there was this respect for workers uh, view, and yet as soon as the men came back from war, all of a sudden, or people, I should say, people came back from war because there were men and women fighting and participating. Um, that mentality kind of went away. It was almost as if it never happened. So they revert back. So now we have 1950s, and now we have more instruction. People are learning how to do things because there's manuals that are being put out. Uh, Deming actually introduced uh, a 10-week program at Toyota which is going to be in about 10 years later uh, referred to as the TPS system or Toyota production system. And if you've ever seen the movie Office Space, where they jokingly say, you know, that filled out the TPS report, that was a nod to that report, that Toyota production system. Um, we also look at systems thinking and PDCA, so the scientific model is finally being introduced. And then in the 1960s, you start hearing things around just-in-time flow, um, stop the line culture, so people closer to the work can actually say, well, I found a problem, stop, and they have the permission and the authority to do that. And they start also looking at things like psychology to influence how people are managed, and that's when you start to see the theory um, X and theory Z be introduced into the workplace. Theory X was that, and you'll love this, theory, theory X was that most people don't like to work and they don't do their best without financial incentives or threats. Sound familiar? Yeah. And then theory Z was actually, uh, no, uh, people are actually motivated by a job well done with their talents are valued and they're cooperating with other people. So we start to see in, interesting things start to flip. And this is 1970s. So this is only 30, well, actually a little bit longer than that, 30 years ago. But these are when um, some of us were born. <laughs> so we had parents who were learning sort of the shift in mentality about how people are being managed. Uh, in the 80s, we start to see Deming rediscovered in the U.S. So Ford says, oh, my gosh, you guys are doing so great with Toyota. Get your ass back here in the U.S. Help us out here because we need to get some help on the way we're doing manufacturing. Um, if it works there, why couldn't it work here? Then 1990s, that's when the infamous waterfall appears and Six Sigma and resource utilization and PMI and PMP and all this process and, and things like that. So now just take a step back and look at this timeline, just within this view, 1950s, we've got 40, 60, 60 years ago. This is a, a, a group of people who have been taught all these different management styles now on how they're supposed to lead other people. And we all know people who are in management and likely in senior levels who still work in these models. And they're, they're not making shifts or changes yet, not all of them. So what I'm asking for all of us to recognize, especially in this Agile community where we're also asking people to change uh, for other things, is to recognize they may never have been introduced to any of this new way of leading people, and you might be the first person that they're going to listen to. And you have to have some sense of empathy for them, of this is a new thing for them, uh, they may never have had a single day of leadership training ever in their entire lives because they just seniorized themselves into a higher paycheck with an office with a door in it. And they're like, oh, I've made it. 
And whether or not they took the initiative to figure out, well, because of that role, I want to do X, Y, Z. I want to get better at what I'm doing. You know, we are in a position in the Agile community to say, hey, if you need some help, I've got some ideas. Um, and that empathy for them is not the, you're doing it wrong. You're a horrible manager. Nobody wants to work for you. Haven't you noticed your attrition rate is in the shitter? You know, that's not the message that we want to go to people with. That's not going to embrace people or have them embrace you. So what we want is challenge the norm. Challenge the norm if it needs to change. Like they understand that there is a need for the change, that people are wanting a different leadership style. Um, and help by being change. Like start acting in the same ways that you're asking for leaders to be, whether you have direct reports or not. And then create offices and workplaces and teams that actually embrace the new norm and recognize that the new norm is going to change every five to 10 years. I mean, we're looking at a new norm right now on this Zoom call and when people are not able to go into the office anymore. So it's even more important for us to consider how all of this is going to evolve uh, for many of us. So I'm going to play this video. Oh, all right. Let's hold up. Hold on. I got to go backwards. I see your hand, Kim. Okay. I, I couldn't find the hand raising thing on Zoom. I don't know why it's not there. Um, I have a question. You know, I, I would think in addition to empathy, that it's also helpful to help the leader understand the why. Why what they were doing in the 1950s doesn't work now. Why they weren't what they were doing in the 1970s. Not had it worked then and it was really great then but why right. well, in addition to the they have empathy but if they don't understand why you're right yeah exactly because we can't one of the things that i learned um probably a little late <laughs> was that the wording that we use whenever we're trying to invoke change is important i'm sorry to say as much as i get annoyed by that. I also recognize that in order for someone to want to listen, I have to use words that encourage them that I'm partnering with them and I'm not coming in as a, a, a you know, someone I know better because the way you've been doing it just sucks. So instead it's more, you know, it worked well at the time. That's what we were using and it was working um, to the extent that it could work. And now we're learning there are new and better ways that can help us improve. So it's a lot of the language of experimentation, evolution, um, what we need now versus what it worked as much as it could when we were using it. And now we're looking at better ways. So it's a lot like uh, Peter Singe's book, The Fifth Discipline, where he talks about a learning organization. If the leaders and all of the directs throughout the whole organization recognize that everything evolves over time, and that all of us are learning something that's going to get us to the next stage and learn something else that's going to get us to the next stage, then it becomes more of a journey versus, a, oh, we're there. Because no, what we do today might not work in five or 10 years. So yeah, recognizing that, um, that history is important. Um, what I love too is that there is a, uh, and I'll play this video next, there's a, uh, a, a commercial that was played over Super Bowl Sunday and many of you may have seen it I'm not even a football fan I actually went out and googled all the commercials that happened during the Super Bowl just so I could watch the commercials without actually having to watch the um, watch the game sorry I'm not a football person but uh, we'll play it out here next It was the first time man walked on the moon. Because he stayed in orbit. Because they guided them safely. Because she made the right calculations. And because he let them focus on the mission instead of the mess. Did anybody else see that? Yeah. Yeah. And you could hear you could hear the words though, right? This time. Yes. <laughs> so That's it's good. interesting. Oh, sorry. I can barely hear whoever's talking. Oh, sorry. It was me. Uh, it just said the audio is much better better than last time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> and for those of you who were watching the very end of that 
um, or really throughout the whole thing. Uh, what I loved about that is they're pointing out every single person that's in the room and mission control and highlighting how important it is that they do their job and they do it well because it actually contributes to the larger mission of launching you know, satellites, rockets, spaceships, you know, shuttles, everything. Even, even the po folks in the back drawing on the chalkboard to do the calculations and the janitor. Like, do we do that at work? Do we actually smile and say thank you or hello even to the janitors as they're going through the office and, and cleaning up? Or the folks who run the little small coffee stands that are in the office? Or our IT folks who make sure that Zoom actually works when we need it? Or WebEx or whatever those other products that we're using? I think that's the important message here is that we're finally seeing, even in the media, they're highlighting and, and shifting our focus to recognize how valuable it is to have every single person that works in your company and what they give to other people and the success of that business. I mean, our business is to make money. If we're not making money, it's you're retired, <laughs> you know, which is where I want to be. But for right now, I got to make money and I need a business who's also making money. So how do we connect all the dots there? But whenever we think about um, this mantra of, you know, think of everyone, treat them all with respect, give them all visibility into the value that they have in the company. It reminds me a lot of what we talk about with um, strategic planning and alignment throughout the whole organization is whoever's making those strategic plans, do they know how important all the other business units and divisions within the company and the people that are doing the planning sessions on a sprint by sprint basis, or if they're doing big room planning or quarterly planning or PI planning, are they coming in and sharing their message around how this team's work is connected and valuable to the larger strategic themes of the company so that we feel not only recognized, but we can see, oh yeah, what I'm doing in the next two weeks, that's what it's for. That's, that's who we're giving this value to. That's why we're doing all this work. And also to question it, because if it's not in alignment, then why are we doing it? So that leadership and that alignment is so important um, to, to make the connections and make them visible. And I love how, sorry, I'm gone past it. I love how Richard Branson from Virgin Airlines um, makes this quote, you train people well enough so they, they can leave, but you treat them well enough so they don't want to. And that's so, so critical. I remember being a first or a second time uh, people manager and I knew there were things that I could never really coach or teach the folks on my team because they were smarter than me. That's why I loved having them on my team. So my focus shifted from, I'm not gonna tell you how to do your job or check in to make sure you're doing your job. If anything, I wanna check in to say, what do you need? Is there a problem with the work you're doing that you need my help with? Like, what am I doing as a manager to clear the path? I feel like that's the, um, what's that Olympic game where they throw that thing across the ice and those people are shuffling in front of them, cleaning the way? Curling? Yeah, curling. 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 So I feel like we're like the master curlers. We're like, and they're trying to, you know, clean, 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 clean all the way through to make sure that there's nothing in the way for the team members that, are, that work with me or that we're paired with. Uh, as well as, you know, pushing elbows with my peers to say, you know, we're, pa we're partners, we're a team, just like people that report to us are supposed to be a team. So how are we embodying the same values, principles, and behaviors that we're asking other people to do? Because if we're not doing it, then how will they know what it looks like? Or, uh, and I love Steve Farber's acronym that he actually got from Jim Kuzis, who wrote the Leadership Challenge, is an acronym called DWYZYWID. Do what you said you would do. Other, other ways we've learned about it is walk the walk, talk the talk. It's like if, you, if you're not doing the very things you're asking for us to do, then why should I listen to you? It doesn't make any sense to me anymore. And I'm also going to wonder, am I working for the right company and I'm in, uh, working with the right boss? Now, to get to that stage, uh, for me, I had to fall in love with my job. And I found out very quickly early on in my career, I didn't love my job. <laughs> so I needed to find a job that I did love. Um, and when I first was trained around Scrum, it was in 2005. And I remember thinking, oh, this is awesome. 
I am never going to put PMP on the end of my name or my business card again. I am so done with traditional project management. This is, this is like the new way. And so we started using this word love in different ways. And so I'd ask for all of you who might be muted to unmute yourselves and just call out the end of this sentence. I love my kids. Ice cream. <laughs> Pets. Chocolate. <laughs> Camping. Camping. Oh, yeah. I found my friends. You and me, lady. <laughs> if you got bourbon on your list, we're going next week. Well, we hey, look. Do some virtual well, camping. We're good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we're bonding already. So the one thing about this word love is uh, many people just start to assume that we're talking about the very white definition of love, right? <laughs> <laughs> and that's what you can't do at work. No, this is like a whole HR violation. Like love does not belong in the workplace. But the reality is we show love in so many different ways that sometimes we don't even realize that's what it is. Um, so I'm asking uh, for you all to consider there are a lot of ways in which people are expressing love to you and for you in in. You, you may not even realize it because it's just so simple. Like, have you eaten today? Now, parents might know that very well. <laughs> you know, uh, spouses may also like, have you had coffee yet? Because you really need some coffee right now, I can tell. Um, you know, all of the things that, that might go on in relationships where you are showing something. Like, did you, did you get enough rest? So even in the workplace, I could very easily ask these questions, maybe not the seatbelt thing, unless I work for RTD. Um, I can ask these questions of people that work with me or for me or around me to express some sort of like care. So if you don't like the word love because it just has a weird feeling, then you can use other words to describe it because there are so many different ways. And so we'll watch this next one. The ancient Greeks had four words for love. The first is philia. Philia is affection that grows from friendship. Next, there's storge, the kind you have for a grandparent or a brother. Third, there's eros, the uncontrollable urge to say, I love you. The fourth kind of love is different. It's the most admirable. It's called agape. Love has an action. It takes courage, sacrifice, strength. For 175 years, we've been helping people act on their love so they can look back or look ahead and say, we got it right. We did good. So have you heard all of those different um, variations of the word love before? Yes, but not in a while. Yeah. I actually was reintroduced to it um, through Steve Farber's Love is Just Damn Good Business book recently. And then I found this video online. It was actually a commercial that was also during the Super Bowl. Um, so when you look at some of the, the statistics, um, I actually found this uh, company called Kanunu. And it's sort of like Glassdoor where employees rate or rank their employers. And they have about 250,000 uh, employee uh, responses to reviews on their company. And of those seven, uh, excuse me, 6,751 of them had the word love in the review, which is interesting because if you look at the industries, not surprising, but IT is in there. It's in there. It's in the top 10. So when you think about that, you're like, wow, you know, there are a lot of people who they're saying, yeah, it's not like the what's love got to do with it song, but love's got to be in business. Like this is part of who we are whenever we find jobs that we love, we, we find products and services that we, we feel passionate about. Um, but have we had those jobs where we could be one of those 6,000, almost 7,000 people that put the word love in the employee review, in our employee opinion survey, 
are we doing the work that we love? And are we also leaders? And if the answer is yes to both, oh my God, you're in like the most awesome position, right? But if there's a no in there, then what are we doing to find it? So if we are in a job or working for a company that you just don't, you're not feeling it. There's no juice. It's just a paycheck. You know, I just, I just do it because I got, I got, I got, I need a job, right? But if we could step back and think about the kind of things that we could be doing on a regular basis that did actually come with a paycheck, but it's something that we love to do as well, then why aren't we doing that? Because out of 250,000 people, 6,700 of them did. And don't you want to be one of those? I would, and I am, but I had to leave a job four times to find it. So let's show by a show of hands. How many of you all have actually had a job that you could very clearly say, I loved that job. I loved my boss. I loved the people that I work with. It was awesome. Once. Once. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm back in that thing forever. <laughs> Exactly. So one of the things that I can say for sure, and I can tell you many stories is I, I've had it twice. Um, and I guess, technically speaking, I probably had it three times since I'm working for myself now. And I'm a pretty good boss. I'm just saying. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I first started my career, I was, um, then I went into uh, AOL uh, several years later, worked there as uh, from probably about 15 years. But in that time frame, I got laid off two times and rehired to the same position in, in one of those cases uh, about two months later, because I knew that even though uh, it was a numbers game and it was back, you know, in the early 2000s where layoffs were happening a lot, I knew that the people that I worked with and the products that we worked with, I loved and I wanted to go back. I didn't want to go work somewhere else. So even after getting laid off, I still tried to get back there and I successfully did three times. Um, then I worked for Rally. Um, out of Boulder. And it was because I'd spent probably four or five years um, as the Agile Evangelist at AOL who hired Riley to come out to uh, help me because I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I needed somebody else to kind of teach me. I'd taken a Scrum Master class, but that wasn't enough. I was supposed to be teaching across the globe, going to France and Ireland and Europe and uh, all across the US, coaching and teaching on Scrum and Kanban. And I knew probably as much as someone who first gets out of their two-day two class, and that was it. Um, so I had them help me. But what I recognized in both instances was that I loved the people that I worked with at AOL and at Rally because we had something really important, and that was friendship. We actually loved what we did, and we supported each other on a regular basis. Um, we helped each other even when we weren't even in the same state. So we were using phones and Zoom calls and every kind of other way to connect with each other. And it was really important uh, for all of us because when I was working with Rally, when I left AOL to come work for them, one of the things that um, I wasn't prepared for was not having an office to go to anymore. And so working remotely was my full-time job. Every once in a while, I would try travel to a client site um, and more so whenever I was coaching, but then became a manager and I'm supporting them. And it was difficult because uh, some people that were getting hired on my team, I might have met them for the interview and then never face to face with them for months at a time. And they're on site with clients. So trust is something so fundamental that without that, we could not have built the relationships that we had. And I love what Brene Brown says about, you know, trust is built in the very small moments. Is this, those moments where they count, where I'm having a hard time working with a client in uh, New York City, and I'm literally crying on the plane every single week flying back to Denver, wishing and praying I could get off this account because it just sucks so bad. Mm -hmm. And not realizing until almost a year later that I finally told someone that I worked with at Rally how miserable I was and immediately they were like why didn't you call me I would have totally commiserated with you or helped you get off the account even my boss said that later he said oh I would have gotten you off that sooner and I said well I was afraid that if I if I told you that I was terrible at this job you'd wonder why the hell you hired me so the trust was built sort of in hindsight because once I finally gave in and said look I'm going to be vulnerable here and tell you how 
how much a failure I feel like I am. Um, and then to get the reassurance from my manager and the people that I worked with, some more senior than me, to say, we've all been there. And it's usually, usually, not you. <laughs> a lot of times it is, it's just not a good match with you and whoever you're working with or the client or whatever. And to recognize that people were there for me, um, even when I didn't realize it was really important. And it was a lesson that, for me, that in order to build really good, healthy relationships, I have to be vulnerable and be trusted, but also trust other people that even if I say something or do something or I act a certain way and they're turned off by that, that's actually good because then I know I can walk away from that relationship, that that's not what I need. What I need is people who will stand by me and stick with me when I'm having those moments or when I'm, you know, maybe not having the greatest time of my life right now. Um, not everything is a dirty dancing movie, you know, having the time of your life. Sorry, movie quotes. Anyway. All right. So now, of course, most any of you who know me well, I can't go without even mentioning uh, George Carlin and his crass humor. But one of the more tame quotes that he has, and most people work just hard enough not to get fired and just get paid just enough money not to quit. Is there anybody who feels like that right now? probably a rhetorical question because I don't see all the hands going up, but there might be some. <laughs> if your coworkers are on the video, just do that. <laughs> so I think, you know, having, you know, my experience of getting laid off a bunch of times and then getting rehired, um, our engagement statistics are an indication that not everybody's happy where they're at. And as leaders, whether or not we're a manager or not, are we supporting them in their goal to find a better place? whether that's on this team or on another team or in another company. It is something I feel that most people are shying away from um, and probably even more so right now with all the uncertainty about work. But I would love for everybody to get to a point where this is the team that they work with. Maybe not these individual people, but this is what it looks like. Um, and this was actually taken while we were in Las Vegas about three years ago, I think. And we had been uh, walking around Vegas going from one conference room to another, which literally, and if you know Vegas, you have to walk miles, even within a single hotel. And we'd been on the floor for about 16 hours at this point, and finally had a few minutes of, of freedom. And yes, that's a bar, don't judge, uh, to have some fun and actually relax. But even though we've all, most of us have left the company since then, we still stay in touch. As a matter of fact, one of the happy hours I have uh, virtually tomorrow is with two people in that picture right there. But those are the meaningful relationships that we can build even in the workplace that go beyond the work hours. Uh, these are folks who are going to promote me and I will promote them every time they want to find another job. I'm going to be the first one to recommend them. I'm going to be the ones that they can call to say, I didn't get the job or I had a really shitty day and I just need a bitch it's about something because it didn't go right. And they know I'm going to welcome them with open arms to have that discussion for as long as they need to have it. And that's the kind of work environment for me that's perfect. That's like Mecca, Narnia, whatever fancy word you want to call it. Um, and I wish that for other people as well. Because working hard for something that we don't care about is stress. But working hard for something we love is called passion. So are, are any of you stressing right now? <laughs> Maybe a few, yeah. It may be unrelated to the COVID thing. Yeah, Kelly? Oh, no, sorry. I actually coughed, and then I was realizing that, like, everyone's going to think I'm sick. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. <laughs> so my question to all of you is, would you rather be in a place of stress uh, in that kind of energy, or would you rather place that energy in something where you're more passionate about the work that you're doing? Um, and that's one of the reasons why I became an extreme leadership facilitator with Steve Farber is because – his main quote from his book, Radical Leap, is this, do what you love in service of people who love what you do. And there's three parts to that that merge together, just a beautiful view of what your work-life combination could be. Because I don't actually believe that there's anything really a balance about work-life. I think they're very, very interconnected. And I don't want to separate them that much because I found work and people that I work with that it's the same. 
it's not different. There is no separation. And I want to ask all of you, what do you think about that? Do you think that's possible? Is that something that you want? I think everybody wants it, of course. And, you know, the slide you showed of the several thousand people who, who use the word love in their job thing, right, but that's several thousand out of 250,000. So unfortunately, unfortunately, the reality is, is that those percentages are low. I mean, I'm sure you could, you could poll a lot of people and find they've never had a job that you're talking about that you had with AOL and that you had with Rally. They never experienced it, right? Well, right. some people experienced it for a little while, right? Um, and then was there was a layoff or whatever, right? They, they couldn't stay there. Um, so that that's the challenge. It's, it's, it's not so much selling everybody on, like, do you want this? <laughs> it's more of how can we find that? Yeah. Um, or how can we help, you know, Simon Sinek says, how can we help shift in our sphere of influence our group as much as we can? And there might be a limited ability um, to do any kind of shifting. Yeah, other thoughts? That's why we are in Agile. Yeah, I left my PMP hat also. <laughs> and I'm loving what I'm doing. So it's possible. It's just Very how you much get possible. there. Like, yeah, it's like Kim is saying, like, what do people actually know? Do we know? Do I know how to get from where I'm at if I don't have that to getting there? And I think that's where a lot of us, we get into this cycle where we just keep going to work, keep going to work. And I did it too. I, I probably could have left AOL well before they laid me off the second time. Uh, as a matter of fact, I left twice and got laid off twice <laughs> in the same company. So there were opportunities where I had an, uh, uh, an option to do something different. And for reasons I'm sure I could go into for a whole nother hour, I decided to stay where I was at. But I think that's probably true for many of you, that if you're not in a position right now that you love what you do, you're not working with people who love what you do or for people who love what you do, are we taking the time and taking the steps to actually figure out what that would be if I were to find it? Like, do I even know what it is? Um, and I have to say, I didn't for a very long time. I didn't know what it was that I wanted. I knew I was working with people that I liked around, but the work was just sort of like, eh, I got to do that so I can be with these people. So I'll, I'll just keep doing that. And for a while it worked. Um, but then you kind of get to the point where they start leaving. You're not, you're the one left. And now all the people that you love to work with are no longer there. And then you're kind of faced with a decision like, oh, uh, I, don't, I don't think I want to be here anymore. But now what do I do? So rather than having life kind of lead you uh, by the neck, telling you where to go, it would be a great place for all of us to get to a point where we can figure out a way uh, to make the shift, to make the move, and go somewhere else. But this leads me to my third uh, point and topic is we need each other. Unless you're primarily going to be doing a job that you don't work uh, with anyone else or you don't have customers that are uh, visible or, or you work with all the time or you're retired or whatever, even retired people volunteer and do things anyway. But my point is we need to matter and we need other people to appreciate us and we want to make a difference and not be alone. And that is why belonging is also important in this whole conversation. So how do you know that you belong? You can laugh off mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. People not only being valued for the output, but also for their input, that their ideas are also being brought into consideration as we're thinking about products or solving problems and things of that sort. Yeah. Yeah, that you can influence what's happening. Yeah. What else? What does it feel like when you belong? 
comforting. I'm not being judged. Yeah. Not being judged, comforting. What other kind of words can you think of? And uh, I do not think that what you see if I say something. And if you react, I will take it positively. Even the reaction is not good. Yeah. So there's like a trust and belonging connection is what I'm hearing. Yeah. 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 So whatever happened, we're not leaving each other. We are together. Right. Yeah. And it's kind of like being able to be genuine and authentic in who you are. And like you said, um, you know, not being judged, but not having to play like you're someone else that you're not right. really. Yeah. And I want you to also think about this question or this statement, really. Do you think that everyone grew up with a feeling of belonging in their life. Yeah. Yeah. Not everyone has had that or had that growing up. Um, and when you think of belonging, most people say my first experience with belonging is with my family, the people that I was closest to, my friends. Um, they had, you know, all the, like when we were kids, you know, we, we lived across the street from each other and we always played and, and you don't even remember the conversations. You don't even remember what you did, but you just remember, I felt like I belonged because I had friends in the neighborhood. I had somebody I can sit next to on the bus going to school and that kind of thing. Um, and for me, yes, this is me and my family. <laughs> we had a very uh, tumultuous relationship, all five of us, but there was there were moments of belonging and I think that uh, we have to recognize and I think I'm very um, well, I, I have a lot of empathy for other people who didn't have that feeling of belonging because I grew up in a family that alienated more than they did belonging. Um, and so I was taught that at a very young age is that uh, you, you are different. Um, you're not normal. You, you know, there's something wrong with you there. If you don't do this, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and so when we think about that context of someone who just then gets out of school and has their first job or their 10th job, and that is in the back of their mind about what a relationship means. Um, and that's the connection that they have to that extent. Then it also makes you uh, consider what are all the things they went through? Like, where did they grow up? Were they ostracized because they were a band geek like me? And then find out that many people that I work with were also band geeks. So yeah, band camp. Here we go. <laughs> Right. So all the stuff that used to make us feel like alienated and ostracized as we grow older, we're like, oh, we're actually more connected now because I felt the same pain that you felt uh, when you were younger. And I know what it's like to have a perm when you should never have had a perm. You know, case in point. So, you know, you grow up, you get into college, you start making connections with other people. Now you're on your own. You don't have family kind of telling you what to do. Um, you have a little bit more freedom. And yes, this was in the late 80s. So, of course, Bart Simpson was like my thing. I also loved the snow and the mountains. So, of course, I moved to Colorado uh, about seven years ago. Uh, loved Prince. You can even see uh, Opus uh, from the uh, cartoons up in the corner. We, I had tons of things that connect us all around us. It's like our, our personal things. Like if you think about when you either did or do work in the office, a lot of people bring their personal life into their office and they build this like cocoon and yet it's open for everyone to see is like, Hey, look at my office. Like these are the things that I love and care about. It might actually generate a conversation with between us because now you can see a little bit more of who I am. And yeah, we, we might actually have been band geeks uh, back when we were in high school, but you know, that actually makes it easier for me to connect with you because now you kind of know a little bit about what I went through whenever we were ridiculed by the, uh, dance squad and the cheerleaders because we were wearing these ridiculous uniforms or whatever, or we would go to school uh, in the summer because that's whenever we were learning how to do marching band or symphonic band or whatever else. So all of those things help us. And it also happens in the workplace. All right. So we're going to play a little game here. Fictive kinship means that people who are not biologically related to you, you treat as if they are kin. How many people in here have a woman or a man that you feel is like your brother or sister? Right. And maybe even your kids call them aunt or uncle. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. 
That's fictive kinship. What's really cool about fictive kinship is that it allows us to be connected and feel connected even though we're not biologically related. The other really cool part about fictive kinship is that it also shares two elements, pride and shame. So when something really wonderful happens in our life, we have a moment of being proud, not just for ourselves, but for the other person. When something sad or tragic happens, we have a shared shame. Does that make sense? All right. We can solve what is going on here in St. Louis, but also globally, if we use fictive kinship as a way to get close to each other and look for solutions. And so this video is actually from several years ago. Uh, but what I loved about that is that it gave a term to what we used to say, that's my work husband or my work wife or my work brother or work sister, because we were making these really good connections in the workplace. Uh, we were finishing each other's sentences. We were going to lunch together. We were going to happy hour or dinner or even parties with our families on the weekends. And we're creating families that we choose instead of the families that we're born with. And for me personally, that was really critical because I don't have a relationship with my biological family. And so I was constantly reaching out for people in the workplace unconsciously. But when I would find people that could appreciate who I was and give me that family in the workplace, that, that, that was more important to me than really anything else, which is why it's also important that I have that blend uh, between work and life. And it's not a balance. It's, it's a commingling of both of those things. But one thing that happens too often, and I feel that it could, and it probably will happen even more so right now because we are working from home for the unforeseeable future, is the temptation to isolate. And it may be subconscious, and it may be purposeful, but we have to remember there are a lot of people that didn't have a relationship uh, with folks at work, and now they're not going to work at all, and what that can do to the work you, that you do, but also to the individual. Um, we stop sharing, we stop opening up, we stop connecting, and what I want for folks is to recognize what are some ways in which we can connect that is not necessarily related to the work what we're doing, but it opens the door so that isolation and uh, the temptation of pulling back uh, happens less and less and that we take a stand on this in the workplace. And so when you look at some of the Harvard Business Reviews or even statistics that are gathered all over the world, they're saying that the most common pathology is not heart disease or diabetes, diabetes, it's loneliness. Uh, it has a huge impact on us uh, from a physical perspective as well as an emotional one. And so I'm going to do a series of exercises with you now to try to help me feel connected to you and hopefully for you to feel connected with other people who are also on this call by kind of testing the waters a little bit about how similar we might be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if, you're, if your uh, microphones were on, hopefully you laughed. Hopefully you I laughed. Did. Yeah. Yeah. Please don't so, let Kevin Bacon die. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> let's just keep him around. <laughs> so let's let's keep going. I'm going to test a little bit more. Let's see if we we can connect on another level. <laughs> <laughs> so we're already letting our guards down, and I started first. Like I didn't literally write this and put it out on on uh, Facebook, but these are the kinds of messages that we often start sharing. Because humor is the, one of the first places where we see people let down their guard and open up to learn a little bit more about each other. Now, I prefer to use some of the things that are more self-deprecating because that's who I am. Uh, and to be more human and to be more normal makes me more approachable, hopefully, uh, as well as me to connect with other people who feel the same way. And so that is what uh, Brene Brown talks about with authenticity. It's a daily practice of letting go of who we think we are supposed to be and embracing who we actually are. That was a huge lesson for me because as a uh, 
younger person moving into the workplace and finally working for a really great company, AOL, in its heyday, uh, I felt like, oh, I got to look the part. I got to clean up. I have to pretend to be professional, even though I'm not, because I love George, Car George Carlin. And in the back of my mind, there's an F-bomb just waiting to leak out. And I'm afraid <laughs> if I do that, that people will scatter or I'll lose my job. And, you know, barring that I don't say that in the most inappropriate moments, although it has slipped up a couple of times. Uh, by showing people who I am, then the people who, who stay are the ones that I can continue to build relationships with. Uh, and we are teaching other people, no matter what they are, that it's okay to be normal and whatever normal is because there is no normal anymore. There's like, there's who I am and who you are um, and what you find funny. Uh, and that is the way that we start connecting uh, and start having conversations where people start the trust and the, uh, the absence or the, the diminishment of loneliness and more the connectedness, which is why I am going to end our conversation tonight by inviting every single one of you to the community of love and belonging. And that is something that I started last July. It is a potluck dinner once a month. Uh, I usually host two or three of them uh, every year and then other people volunteer to host around the greater Denver area. We have people who host in Boulder and in Longmont and uh, here in Denver and in Centennial and so all the other places. And we have taken it virtual this month. <laughs> so our next potluck is on March 30th at 5.30. And if you are not already a member of the group, it's on LinkedIn. Uh, it's a closed group mainly because I'm inviting folks who live here in Denver because the intention is to create relationships um, and bonds between people who live all over the place and knowing that we all live everywhere. That's why I invite different people to um, host the physical event near their home. So that way we have different places all over this area that at once a month, everyone has an opportunity to find a place to go have dinner and uh, chat and build relationships with other people. And it is not about agile. It is just strictly about people and connections and feeling like they have somewhere to go eat and socialize with folks. Um, primarily the people that invite that joined the group were agilists from somewhere in the uh, community. However, uh, I have invited my neighbors, uh, some friends who don't work in the Agile space, and I encourage everyone who joins the group to do the same so that we start bridging the gaps between industries and Agile and non-Agile so that we start kind of flowing this thing around. Um, so with that, I would encourage all of you to join the group because uh, as our Mile High conference theme was supposed to be uh, transforming us, um, it doesn't happen unless we start with ourselves. Thank you so much, everybody, for attending tonight. And I'll hand either over to Sandy or for questions, comments. Um, I'm happy to stay on as long as everyone wants to. You just might watch me eat. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Chris. Thank Krista, you. thank you so much. Um, if anybody has questions, um, please feel free. Um, otherwise, hopefully we will see you next month at the next Agile meeting. All right. Thank so you so much. Questions, please feel free to, to chime in. So, Kristen, this is Kirsten. Um, you brought in, you know, humor as a way to break down those barriers. But I, you know, while you were speaking, I actually emailed my um, – loved coworkers from the past and told them that I love them. But as, as I'm in, as I'm in the situation now where there's tensions and I don't have that, those feelings, what are some other ideas that you have around building it where you are? The, the building the um, trust or belonging or connection? Um, None of any of them. Like when you're starting from, you know, low, zero, not zero, but you know, three, you know, um, so I think trust is part of it. Yeah, maybe trust would be where I'd start. Well, so when I was at AOL, one of the first things we started to recognize um, was that it was a multinational employed company. We had, because I lived in Northern Virginia for about 20 years before moving here. 
And so I had folks from India, from China, from Japan, from Europe, from US, from Mexico. I had folks on my team that were from all over the world. And the one thing that I love is food. I love food and I love food from all kinds of places. So we did a potluck in the office once a quarter and the theme essentially was chosen by everybody who wanted to participate. But one of the first ones we kicked off was uh, it's a potluck where you bring one of your favorite dishes when you were growing up and hopefully you made it or you found someone who could make it. And then we'd bring it to a conference room during lunch um, and really just socialize. Because one of the things that I found was I, I do love talking shop. I, I will talk about agile till your ears bleed if you let me, but I also recognize that doesn't really tell you who I am. And it doesn't help me to connect with you on a human level yet. It might open the door, but I need another, another step, another way. So I don't want to uh, suggest that food is the only way, but for me and for us, everybody loved food. We all loved international food. And I have a huge Indian fan uh, for Indian food. So we had a bunch of Indians on our, our team. And so they actually taught me how to make gulab jamun and I made it from scratch and I brought it into the office. They were all thrilled. So I made the food thing as food is a way to get people together and over food, we can have conversations. And that actually helps build relationships in the workplace, but yet we're around the work versus about the work. Cause if we stay focused on the work, we don't really get to know each other. Uh, but when we're talking about something that's not work related, that for me and for our team worked better. And I definitely say that made a huge difference for our groups because we started noticing that um, other teams that sat near us would always see us with all our crock pots and our pizzas or whatever it was. And they're like, what are you guys doing? There's a free food in there. And I'm like, yeah, come on over. And then we ended up having like more than one team start to contribute to it. And it got bigger and bigger, but I'd love to hear from other people. What other ways do you have that experience or, or you suggest? Is food the only answer? <laughs> well, actually I was thinking about, um, you know, so food actually does really work. Um, and I think that modeling the vulnerability that you were talking about, like right now we're showing up in Zoom meetings for work and I'm just kind of looking like hell and not worrying about it too much. You know, just like letting myself be human yeah, I think that is helping us too. Um, but yeah, I'm just interested. So I think, like you said, revealing your own humanness, yeah, I think is a big one um, too. Yeah. Another thing you can try, uh, just listen. Sometimes just do not talk, just listen. That, that create a deep bonding. Um, I experienced this one. Well, and you reminded me uh, also of uh, something that we teach in some of the other uh, Agile courses around um, observation and mindfulness. And they're kind of connected because what we often, I find myself at least in this phase where I'm, I'm not really paying attention to everyone else in the room. Uh, I'm so focused on trying to get through whatever I'm going through or, or presenting that I'm not making eye contact and noticing people's faces, their body language, uh, the way they talk, the inflection or non-inflection in their voice. And so, uh, Kirsten, maybe one of the things could actually be to take a couple of uh, days or weeks where you set an intention to notice how other people may be feeling or uh, acting in certain environments and then privately reach out to them uh, and it sounds like maybe Nasima had this, and I've had this before, where someone came to me and said, hey, we were on that call yesterday. You seemed like you were just having a crap day. How are you doing? What's going on? And I think that also relates back to what someone said earlier about um, what does it feel like when you feel like you belong? Is that people notice you? And they don't just notice you when you're in the room, but they notice you when you're not. Yeah, thank you both. Thank you. You make me emotional, Christine. Amazing presentation. <laughs> well, that's what all this is about, right? Yeah, yeah. You, your presentation is um, a touch, the, you know, the soul is <laughs> different. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Anyways, thanks, everyone. Very nice thank to meet you. you. Yeah, thank you.
satisfy them. Yeah, very nice. Thank you. I just, I was so drawn to your speak, your, this opportunity to hear you, Christine, because I just love bringing, I love the fact that you're brave enough to bring love into, uh, into our workspace. I think it matters so much. It does. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. And one of the groups that I, I work with, I haven't actually met with them in a long time, but now I feel like I need to reach out to them again. Uh, with all the um, physical distancing and all that kind of stuff, uh, they taught me this. So everybody's getting a hug. <laughs> <laughs> so that's your virtual hugs. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you everybody for attending and I'll, I'll stay on if anybody wants to chat. Thank you. I'm going to drop off. This is lovely. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you. Thank you. Over the world.